No matter how many times we see the footage, it shocks us. During the Holocaust, an estimated six million Jews died under the regime of Adolf Hitler. They died from starvation, disease, and gassing. But there are some who say that these pictures are not real, that much of what is known about the Holocaust is fiction and not fact. One person who questions the existence of the Holocaust is Mr. Mark Weber. Mark is a Holocaust revisionist. He is the editor and spokesman for the Institute for Historical Review. And also joining us is Mr. David Cole, another revisionist. He's a member of the Committee for Open Debate on the Holocaust. David was recently under the attack or under attack by members of the Jewish Defense League while he was speaking on the subject because David is Jewish. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here. We appreciate your coming. We have all seen the specials, the news clips, the footage. Everyone around the world believes that the Holocaust took place. Why do you think it didn't? Well, Montel, it's very important to understand that no one says that those pictures are not real, as you indicated at the beginning of the program. The pictures are very real. They're very horrible. They're very tragic, and we've all seen them. We've all heard that six million Jews died in the Second World War during the Holocaust. But it's very important to understand what these pictures show and what they don't show. The people, these pictures were taken at the Belsen, Bergen-Belsen concentration camp at the end of the war by the British when they liberated the camp. The people shown these pictures, and it's a very, very terrible pictures. Nobody denies that. Nobody says it didn't happen. Nobody says it's not true. These people were victims of starvation and disease. They died in the last weeks of the war. And they died in the last weeks of the war as, in fact, indirect victims of the war. British uh, uh, doctors who were at the camp themselves at the time that the camp was liberated and many uh, uh, inmates who were at the camp uh, uh, there and elsewhere have also confirmed that conditions at Belzen, although certainly not a, not a country club, were relatively good until the final weeks and months of the war. And that was because in the final weeks and months of the war, all of Germany, all of Europe was in complete chaos. All the railroads were, in, were, were ruined. It was impossible to supply food. It was impossible to supply water. And particularly at Bergen-Belsen, thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews were evacuated from camps further to the east as the Soviets were coming in and sent into this and other camps which were enormously overcrowded. And these people died in large numbers by disease and starvation. But if the policy of the German government had been to exterminate these people, they would, not, they would have long since been dead and these pictures would not have been taken. In fact, the, Ger the German government policy during the war was a very grim one, it was a very harsh one, and so forth. No, as I said, again, no one denies those pictures. But those people were not victims of a program or a policy of extermination. And that's what Holocaust revisionists say. Well, let's, let's go back a little bit in history here so we can kind of bring everybody up to speed. Because I asked for a history lesson myself. I've done some reading on World War II and knew a few things. But just 1933 was when Hitler became the Fuhrer. 1933 was also when Dachau opened. Uh, 1938, Hitler entered Vienna, making it part of the Third Reich. 1939, Germany invades Poland. We go on to 1940, the Nazis invade Holland, Belgium, France, Luxembourg. 1941, they invade Russia. 1941, the first death camp was open. And 1942, the final solution was discussed openly. And that final solution was a solution that included the extermination of the Jews. Is that not there, correct? There, there, you raise a lot of very, very good points. There was, we know from German documents, we know from German officials during the war, they did talk about something they called the final solution to the Jewish question. And the German documents to talk about this. But in the m thousands, millions, tons of German documents seized at the end of the war that deal with Jewish policy, there is not a single document, not a single piece of paper, which talks about or confirms or even discusses an extermination policy. Yeah, but now, Mark, wait, 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 wait Hitler was, also knew that if, let's say, he didn't win this war and someone ever found a document that stated that, life would be real tough for him and everyone else. We know. We have German documents which show exactly what the policy was. And uh, these documents are, in fact, very, very important. The German, what the German officials meant by the final solution policy was before 19, uh, end of 1941 was a policy of forced, um, or, or forced expulsion from Europe by forced emigration, if, if necessary and need be. After 1941 and 1942, this policy changed to one of force of, of deporting Jews, uprooting them, and sending them to the east. And that meant first to ghettos and camps in Poland, and then later throughout the war, they were sent to the occupied Soviet territories. That's what the German officials during the war said and meant by this final solution to the Jewish question. Now, at Nuremberg, this, of course, this whole issue came up at Nuremberg. All of the German defendants at the big Nuremberg trial, 1945, 1946, 
all said that they had no knowledge during the war of any extermination program. Wait a minute, although, if I had been a German, wait, if I had been a German guard at one of these camps, in Dachau, Auschwitz, and somebody said, did you participate in the, in the, the murder of a million people? I would have said, no, it was you. Homeboy did it, that wasn't me. And I would have said, no, I never saw this before. I would have lied and said anything that I could have said to prove that I wasn't involved. That, that's, a, that's very reasonable. But what these men had to say was also, is also consistent from the, from the documents that we have uh, and, and what we know about. And it's also consistent from everything we know about the policy uh, uh, from, from many other sources. All right, well, now, David, I mean, I, I would think that there are enough older, Jewish people in this country, people who are survivors, people whose families lived through the Holocaust, who would right now uh, be willing to do exactly what happened to you a couple weeks ago, and that's attack you because you are Jewish. And to step forward and say this would be like myself stepping forward and saying that the United States government never brought slaves to this country. But now, if you were to say that, couldn't people then make a case to show that there was, in fact, slavery? I am not trying to aggravate anybody, anybody. Of course, I know that I am gravely aggravating people to the point where they uh, will actually physically come up and attack me. But I think it raises uh, many interesting issues, specifically the role of truth in society. What happens when you have eyewitnesses and yet you have other evidence, physical evidence, forensic evidence, the evidence of documents and intercepted transmissions? You make a point, Montel. You make a grave assumption. Uh, a leap of faith when you say, well, the reason we don't have these documents showing, uh, you know, with, where the Germans discussed what they did is because Hitler didn't want him around, I guess, had him burned or something because he knew that it would get him in trouble. But that's making an assumption. Now, other people might say we don't have the documents because there aren't any, because they never existed. Okay, well, what about all of the things that you hear about the gas chambers and all those things, the, the, the mass graves, graves with Well, with now, no one, doubts, no one doubts mass graves. No one doubts that there were bodies in this camp. And let me just, for the record, state that I don't doubt that it was an incredibly horrible thing that happened to the Jews of Europe, something that uh, should not be thought of in any uh, lighter sense, specifically because we doubt that there were gas chambers. These people were taken out of their villages, uh, split up from their family, and put into camps and made to work as forced labor and this is a horrible situation and people died from disease and starvation and just plain being worked to death it is not that we are trying to sugarcoat what happened but it's been many years after the fact and it's time that we brought the facts in uh in parallel to uh the actual uh, history of what happened yes ma'am um the fact still remains yes that six million jews were killed and whether or not the documentation shows that it was the intent to completely get rid of Jews, it, it doesn't matter whether or not the intent was there because it happened. Six million Jews were murdered. Well, now, I, if, I, if, I could, if, I could, if I could just address well, that for a second. Of you. Okay, so both David and Mark, that's a very important issue because both of you dispute the fact that six million Jews Wait, died. If I could make a point, now she said the fact that six million Jews died, however, in 1988, the, uh, Aus the site at Auschwitz, where people can go and tour the gas chambers, uh, they lowered their figure from 4 million dead to 1 million dead. So that was 3 million taken out of the equation overnight. Where did these 3 million go? Were they never there in the first place? Were they in the camps and did they survive? And if you can lose 3 million people overnight, who's to say that 1 million remaining figure is not also wrong? And let me ask you this question. Weren't, weren't some of these... Weren't some of these figures ascertained after the fact because they went back and did censuses after? The source of the famous six million figure is an affidavit by one of the, uh, by somebody who was brought in at the Nuremberg trial in 1945-46. Even Raoul Hilberg, who's considered one of the major uh, figures in the Holocaust, uh, who, Holocaust historian, he's a professor at the University of Vermont. He concedes himself that the six million figure is, is, a, is based upon crude calculations. It is only highly dubious, and he says we must re-examine this whole question of the six million. Look, it's very interesting, Montel. People have heard over and over about six million Jews dying in Europe during the Second World War. How many people in this audience know how many Germans died during the Second World War? How many Americans died during the Second World War? How many Chinese died during the Second World War? In America, as time goes by, the more time passes, the more there's emphasis on the fate of one particular people during the Second World War, almost to the exclusion of everyone else. Uh, how many of... Well, that, no, that, that is... 
Mark, let, 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 okay. let me make another point. I mean, in, right now in Washington, D.C., a federal government agency, a taxpayer-funded uh, agency of the federal government, the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, is organizing and building an enormous museum in Washington, D.C. There's no comparable museum in Washington, D.C. to the victims of slavery. There's no comparable museum in Washington, D.C. to the fate of the Indians or any other people. But there is an enormous be muse museum being built under U federal government auspices to the fate of only one particular people and not one other place. How many Chinese died during the Second World War? According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the number of civili Chinese civilians alone who died during the Second World War is more than 20 million. More than 20 million. Who knows it? Who well, even wait, cares? But, but are, we, are we saying that, therefore, we should not believe what happened to the Jewish people because these other things are admitted? Or should we, Montel, should we stop and say that we believe what happened? Montel, it's right and proper to memorialize the dead, the dead of all wars and the dead of all uh, uh, genocide or all mistreatment, whatever it happens to be. But what is not right is to take the fate of one particular people and, in effect, make a kind of political football out of it. I, to, I, I would like to also interject, speaking as a Jew, the Holocaust is an extremely important thing to especially American and Israeli Jews because most American Jews tend to be secularized and the Holocaust and the shared history of persecution has tended to take the place of the religion of Jews. Now, I'm Jewish. I'm also an, a also an atheist. I don't buy many things. I don't buy concepts of mysticism, spirituality, and especially myth. And I have read both sides of the issue extensively, and I'm not looking to hurt anybody, but I do have to say from my own point of view that the evidence saying that there were no gas chambers is a lot stronger than any of the evidence that can be presented saying there were. All right, well, then let's stop there and take a break. And when we come back, we'll find out, like David said, is it myth or is it truth? We'll find out when we come back. We're talking about the Holocaust and whether or not it happened or it didn't happen. And you had a question, sir. Yeah, this was a remark to uh, Dave's earlier statements. You said that they weren't really being uh, prosecuted, um, persecuted. There we go. Uh, my point is, they, they were the Jews were selected uh, specifically to be annihilated. I think that's more important than the fact that they were selectively chosen out of various groups to be annihilated. Uh, and secondly, I, I do have to agree with you to a degree that. Uh, what happened in Cambodia with Khmer Rouge wasn't played up as much as the, the issue with the Jews, but that still doesn't lessen the fact that the Holocaust occurred. Mm -hmm. And you both say that it, it didn't occur. No. Uh, we, don't, we don't say the Holocaust didn't occur. That's really too simplistic. You know, the so what is a revisionist then? Okay, then, then make it simple what, enough. What wait a second, before you go, because you're, you're talking a little heady. I want you to make sure everybody can understand what it is you're talking about. What is it that a revisionist wants there to be shown in history? Revisionists say three essential things. We say, first and foremost, there was no policy or program to exterminate the Jews of Europe during the Second World War. Okay, so now stop right there for a second. Don't go too quick, which refutes exactly what the gentleman just asked you, because he said that the policy was they were picked out and isolated to be that, annihilated. That's certainly true. So you're they, saying that's not true? No, they no, were they were, they were They were selectively persecuted. They were picked out. They were put in ghettos. They were put in camps. They were uh, a victim group, but there was not a policy or program to exterminate them. Wait a minute, wait. I want, I want you, you're getting ready to run real quick, and I want to slow you down so we can get every point out of what you're saying. So if they were selected individually as a group to be put into ghettos and to be starved to death, what was the key, whether or not it was a gas chamber or not, they were starved to death? No, 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 no. Montel, look, I mean, during the Second World War, as you well know, as everyone in California, I think, knows, uh, the West Coast Japanese were also selected. They were rounded up. They were they put were into camp. Sure. Well, yes. Europe was not, Europe during the Second World War was not the United States during the Second World War. There was a lot of food uh, in the United States. There were peace, essentially peacetime conditions. War didn't come here. Certainly the J Japanese were not treated anywhere near as bad as the Jews. But the point is simply that they were selectively persecuted. And that's true. That was certainly true with the Jews. And I, I just want to also pipe in and say that I'd like to call you on what you said. So what if there were no gas chambers if they were starved to death? Hey, if, if you... If, if we even make that much of a point, we've refuted a lot of what is in the history books that say there are gas chambers. Now, if all of a sudden the story is going to change and that the genocide was through starving them to death, well, that makes a great big difference because then all that you've read in your history has been wrong. We're, we're not prepared to deviate at all from the facts that are presented to us. And if the facts were ever to show that they were starved to death, we would reflect that. Okay, now the second point, you said there are three points. That was the first point. Right. Second one. The second point, Montel, is that we dispute 
uh, the claims made over and over about gas chambers and gassings. That's the weapon of extermination, supposedly. It's very important to realize in this context that the Holocaust story or the gassing story has changed dramatically over the, over the years. At the big Nuremberg trial of 1945-46, it was claimed that people were gassed at Dachau, at Buchenwald, and at various camps in Germany proper as well. Right after the war, it was claimed not that people were gassed at Auschwitz, but that they were electrocuted to death. And then later the we found is, out that all the gas chambers were in Poland. Give me the third the point. The point is that the evidence for supposedly gassings in some camps has just been done away with. It's, right. it's a maybe, okay, the third point is we say that no, uh, no, nothing like six million Jews in Europe died during the Second World War. And it's very important in this regard also to realize that every Jew, every Jewish person who, in the Second World War who died of whatever cause is considered, quote, a victim of the Holocaust. That is, Jews who died even in Allied bombing attacks. Jews who died uh, for whatever reason, they're considered victims of the Holocaust. So and you're that is saying also illegitimate. All, all six million is a compilation figure of every Jewish person who died during the war. Look, even a number of uh, prominent Holocaust historians have conceded the six million figure is essentially symbolic in nature. It's repeated over and over, and it's not necessarily... All, all sorts of other things can change, and the six million figure will stay the same. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have two things to say. First of all, a death is a death. These people have died. I don't understand why you want to read... What do, you, what do you have to gain like by it. questioning the facts in history? What is it? What's your purpose in all of this? Is it, is the, is what, let me ask this question. Is, is knowing the truth about what happened in your past important to, to you? Well, to me, death is death. They have all died. They've, it was hurtful to many people. Why is it we have to question whether somebody set forth to gas chamber people or whatever? What do you have to gain? Well, see, that is a philosophically based question, not a factual que question. We know that there were camps we had for the Japanese. What if somebody came along and said, we then cut up the Japanese and fed them to crocodiles? It is important for us to know what did happen and didn't happen. And if you're not interested in truth and history, fine. To some of us who are interested in what really happened in the use of truth, the governmental use of truth, how truth can be changed, how truth can be altered, that does matter. A death is a death, of course, but if we say the German people set up gas chambers, you ought to be willing to prove it and ready to prove but it. But now wait, sure. before you even jump in, Mark, David, but isn't it very important also to know that if, if, the, plan was, if the plan was to annihilate a race of people, Mm -hmm. If that was the plan, genocide for a race of people, does it then matter if there were gas chambers or if it was starvation? This lady's making a very interesting point. The point is death is death and they set oh out to kill people. Maybe it's a fine line. I'm not arguing it with you that maybe it's a fine line, but then why do we get all the flack when we then try to deny that there were gas chambers based on the facts available? If it is such a fine line, if it just don't matter at all, then we ought to be able to say, well, here's some evidence showing that there are no gas chambers, and everybody say, well, fine, but it was death, and we'd say, sure, it was death, all the same, and all the same thing about the idea of there being a final solution. Show us the evidence that there was the idea to have a, a genocide of all the Jews, and if you show it to us, uh, and if it passes uh, at least my own personal uh, skepticism uh, when looking at things, then I will be the first person to say I'm Dave the Dunce. Just uh, kick me out of the studio. But I want to see the evidence first. Okay, yes, sir. Two questions. You make it one because I got to switch. You got to go to break. Okay. Uh, how many uh, Jews did the Germans have their hands on during the war that they could have exterminated theoretically? That, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, the. Um, uh, I, I believe that the total number of Jews in Europe who died under German control or access control during the Second World War is probably in the neighborhood of a million, a million and a half. I don't think that, it, that the Germans even had under the control six million Jews during the Second World War. This was confirmed, I think, by a report that was issued by the International Labor Office in, uh, and by various... There's a number of reasons why I say that. Okay, we have to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to meet some survivors of the Holocaust, and they'll tell us what they saw and whether or not what they're saying, both Mark and David, it's true or false. We'll be back in just a second. We've been talking about the Holocaust with revisionist Mark Weber and Mr. David Cole. But joining us right now are Dr. Michael Thaler. Michael is a president of the Holocaust Center of Northern California. Michael is also a survivor who lost more than 60 members of his family in the Holocaust. Also joining us are Ernest and Anna Hollander. They are both survivors. Anna's entire family was wiped out in Auschwitz. Now, before we even go any further in the discussion, Ernest, could you take us back to that day in 1944 when your family arrived at Auschwitz? 
Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to make an opening statement that uh, I watched before on, the, on television, uh, the uh, revisionist, what they said, and I feel it's completely wrong. It's completely not true, uh, because I've been there, and I saw what happened. And I came tonight with pain and agony to tell you all that, these stories, but I also feel very bad, and I feel sorry for these people who, after 50 years, still claiming there was not a Holocaust, and tried, they tried to hide behind the truth. Well, why don't you tell us some of the truth, Ernest? Let us know. Well, this is the truth. In 1939, when Hitler occupied Czechoslovakia, the part of where I live, the Carpathian Mountains, they gave to the Hungarian government. And as they took over the, the government, right away they fired every Jew from state, city, and county jobs. A Jew couldn't hold anymore a job, a government job. Well, it didn't go too long where they started to take all their properties. And uh, before the year was over, we had to wear yellow stars. Jews couldn't get out in the street anymore regular, just certain time, shopping, stuff like that. In 1942, they said that every Jew had to have a Hungarian citizenship papers. Now, we had close to three-quarters of a million Jews living in Carpet Carpathian Mountains. More than half didn't have Hungarian citizenship papers. We were lucky. My father was born under the Austrian-Hungarian regime, and we were able to get our citizenship papers. Okay, but that, that's before the war. And so I want you to bring us... That uh, was that, 19, no, during the war, 1942. That was 1941, end of 41. Okay, end of 41. But bring us up to the point when okay. we know the historical things that took place, but we need to know whether or not the Holocaust itself took place. What happened in 1944? What did you see with your own eyes when you yeah. arrived at Auschwitz? In 1944, I had eight brothers and sisters, four brothers, four sisters. My father and mother, we arrived finally to Auschwitz, where they right away took away my mother and three little sisters, and they killed them. Killed them in the crematoriums and the gas chambers. The rest of the family went to work, to labor camps where my father was working in a railroad station and uh, working in a sawmill where he cut off his left arm. The blade somehow cut his hand. They put him against the wall. They shot him right away. They never kept somebody in the camp if he could learn this piece of bread and a uh, little hot soup. But now, when you say they took your mother and your three younger sisters away right there on the spot, and they took them away to the gas chamber, right? And this was in Auschwitz. How do you know that that's exactly where they took them to? Because we stayed two days in Auschwitz, and some people who worked in the crematoriums, some people who worked in the gas chambers, they told us that they saw all these people who Dr. Mengele, the angel of that, sent them to the left. They went straight into, into the gas chambers and into the crematoriums. Well, now, Dr. Dr. Taylor, you know a lot, I mean, a lot about the history of the Holocaust. You've heard what both these gentlemen have to say. Do you think that they're right, or is it, is it even worth the discussion that we're having today? Well, I think that the discussion today is merely to allow those people, the vast majority, of course, who don't really know what happened, uh, an opportunity to, uh, to really find out what the truth is. And uh, what you just heard is a tissue of lies. It's basically a combination of half-truths, uh, fantasy, and, uh, and, and downright uh, falsehood. And, uh, you know, I can begin uh, taking it apart very let's, easily. Let's start from the very beginning. Why, okay. The claim is that there were no gas chambers. Right. There was no uh, plan to annihilate the Jews. Start with the gas chambers and tell me why that's, that's not true. All right. Um, well, I'll start with the most recent evidence, though it's been 50 years. Most recent evidence produced by the young uh, historians in Germany German historians working on German uh, evidence, German documents, have shown in the last five years that the entire program, including the gas chambers, uh, originated from a program which they, uh, the Nazis called the euthanasia program, which is typical of the terminology that they use. They always inverted the real meaning. Euthanasia, you know, there's going to be an initiative on the California ballot on euthanasia. And euthanasia literally means mercy killing. And the way we talk about euthanasia, it means at the request and at the desire of the patient that when they want to end their life, okay? 
The Nazis used that term just the opposite, to kill people, to murder, to mass murder people whom they no longer desired uh, to be alive because they were useless to them, they couldn't work, they were blind, they were deaf. They even killed soldiers who came back from the front on this program. But now we can get that, but that doesn't tell me about gas chambers. Okay. Tell me well, about gas chambers. Okay. In order to institute this program, throughout Germany there were installations set up with gas chambers which were disguised as shower rooms in places like um, Hadamar, um, um, Gross uh, Grosseck, um, uh, Brandenburg, um, Sonnenstein, um, uh, Hartheim by Linz, and so on, where they developed this entire program where they took up to 80,000 German children and people who were, as I said, useless to the right, and simply gassed them with the excuse of taking them to the showers and then cremated them. And by 1941, August 1941, there was such an outcry in Germany from the bishops and from mistakes that they made by sending two urns to one family, you know, for one child, that they terminated the program. And at that point, they took the staff of this entire program, took them to the killing camps, Sobibor, Belzitz, Treblinka, and many of those people became the commanders and the leading people, both in the construction of the gas chambers and, and in the use of the gas chambers. They also had experimented with the Cyclone B gases during that euthanasia program. And so and there, there is physical proof there is of that. There is physical left evidence, and okay. there is also strong documentation brought out by the German historians themselves. And this was the beginning of that program, which was then later applied to the destruction of the Jews. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I just mind. Uh, it's a comment and question directed to you two on the end. It seems like you're running around, Mark and David. Uh, Mark and David um, you seem like you're running around um, in two ways. One, the gas chambers. You say they're prove it. There weren't any. Well, inside the Third Reich proves, um, talks about it. There are personal experiences that talk about it. That should be enough. Um, and that they, they have proof of them being there. Second is that you say six million, that's, well, wh it, maybe it's less or whatever. Maybe it is. Maybe it was a million. So what? That's a million people. I mean, that's a lot. Well, now... We, we are not trying to downplay the seriousness that anybody dies, but you just said, for example, we ought to have enough evidence. That's enough. Place closed, that's enough. Forget about your questions. Uh, let me say one thing, and let me present something to you. How, for example, do you uh, come back at the two forensic studies that have been done, the, at the uh, supposed gas chamber buildings at Auschwitz and Majanek, which, which proves forensically, and the first one was conducted by uh, a man from Boston named Fred Lucher. Fred Lucher had built execution equipment for American prisons, and he was very good at it, and he was recommended for that job. But the second forensic report was done by the people who run Auschwitz, the people who run the Auschwitz Museum, and it proved that there could not have been cyanide gassings in those chambers. How do you come back at that? All right, we'll find out how we come back to that as soon as we take a break. We'll take a break, and we'll be back right after this. This is German duty, the clever. To arouse, whip up, incite the instinctive repugnance of the Jews to an even higher pitch. We've been talking about the Holocaust with re revisionists and survivors, and for mo both Mark and David, if we were to presuppose that the Holocaust did not take place, and we were to pre pre presuppose that there were no gas chambers, there were um, no mass burials and no math, mass gassings, then what we're saying is that someone had a conspiracy to mislead the entire world. Why, for 50 years, would Jewish people want to conspire to mislead well, the entire world? Uh, you see, now you're reading something into that. You're saying they want to conspire. If, uh, if in fact, this was uh, a conspiracy propaganda set up, written by people, presented by people, it was the Soviet government, the British government, and the American government at Nuremberg after the war. The reason that this thing, that most war propaganda ends up dying X number of years after the actual war. One of the reasons, however, that this uh, particular issue has grown in importance since the war is because the Jewish people 
have taken it as a very personal issue. It is very important in Israel. It, is, it was very important for the founding of Israel. This does not make them conspirators. It doesn't make them bad people at all. It's an issue that they take very personally. And in the Western world, uh, Jews are usually very successful. They ha uh, and I'm speaking as a Jew, and I'm not trying to say that they in any way do anything wrong to become successful. But what matters to Jews uh, can oftentimes be reflected in Western society. If you were go to go to Asia, though, this, this uh, the Jewish Holocaust wouldn't matter one way or another because there are not all that many Jews who have po any positions of, of influence in a uh, country like Cambodia. Dr. But, Thaler, but you're, you're right. Dr. Thaler is like, like turning in his seat. What? What did you want to say? Well, first of all, I think it's uh, already false to call these people revisionists. As the Department of History in Duke, um, the, all the professors uh, of history in Duke wrote, in response to one of their ads in the campus newspaper, these people are not revisionists. They don't revise. They are deniers. They're basically denying the truth rather, rather than revising the truth. And, now, and, and, and Dr. Taylor, I, I mean, I'm going to let you finish your point, but then there is also the point that they are questioning history. Right. And we know for a fact, let me finish my point, we know for a fact that history in this country and the books that we see in this country is written incorrectly in a number of ways. But every single point where it gets close to the actual data, the actual information, the actual facts, it's falsehood. For instance, this issue about this man Leuchter, Le Fred uh, or Frank uh, Leuchter Jr., who I uh, just heard uh, quoted as a foremost engineer, uh, you know, with gas chambers. I didn't proving say the that word engineer. Okay. He, there you, you know I, I know why you didn't. Okay. Because, but Fred Lutcher might not have been a licensed engineer, but did he not have the job of building gas chambers and other execution equipment for major American prisons? Was he not profiled on prime he time lives in the Atlantic Monthly? He as had an nothing expert. to do. No. But they were as a matter of fact, this is a lie. The fact is, the man masqueraded as an engineer, a builder of these chambers, and then he was arraigned in Massachusetts for practicing engineering without a license. He is not registered as an engineer. The only uh, uh, scientific training he ever had was a BA in history. He was hired by okay, another... So wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. So, so Dr. Thaler, we've refuted the yeah, fact that okay. this man the had question, any qualifications. The question boils the down whether there was Cyclone B gas used or not. So in 1988, for a fee of $35,000, he uh, went to uh, Beer Canal and he scraped the walls and he did some hocus pocus and he came out 50 years later with the statement that there was no gas and the court in Canada in which this was tried threw it out and declared him a non-expert. Wait a second, sir. We can't hear you okay? up there. But okay. This is a matter of record. All right, Dr. So, Taylor, let's stop there for a second. Okay. Anna, you've been trying to get in. Go ahead. I am a living proof of this. I was age of 13 when they took me to Auschwitz with my family. I'm the only one who survived, and I was by the, not too far from the gas chambers. And we knew exactly where then they brought in Jews, and they burned them. We smelled, we breathed that air, we smelled that air, and we knew, we used to say to each other, you see where we are burning the Jews? I was not too far from the crematoriums. When it happened? Uh, when it happens, and I was 13 years of age. At that time, my whole family is wiped out. Okay, yes, sir. You have yes. One. The Holocaust is big business because uh, Germany so far has given the Jews, I think, at least $200 billion. So it's big business. And some of you are still getting $1,000 a month. And a lot of people don't know this. And then... Uh, people don't realize who brought the slaves to America. They were Jewish ships. Wait, 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 that's a whole nother thing. Let's take a break, because what the issue that we're talking about today is whether or not there was a Holocaust. We'll talk about slavery and who brought them here later. We'll be back after this. We're not going to let you go now. We've been talking about the Holocaust with revisionists and survivors, and you wanted to make a statement. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask a question that's specific in nature, directed towards David over there. Uh, it, we, we have all seen the, the pictures that were shown just re 
before the show of the gas chambers of the metal <coughs> metal gates and everything like that. If you say there were no gas chambers, what were oh, those specific the, the, the pictures? Pictures of what? Now we saw pictures of a mass grave, we saw pictures of dead bodies, and we saw pictures of a crematoria. Uh, did you see pictures of a gas well, chamber? Because uh, well, I think the, uh, you've been smoking the, something before the show. We, we did not <laughs> see any pictures of a gas chamber. Oh, wait, 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 David, we don't have to accuse the guy of being on drugs. What he saw was what it, what. What I have seen in several specials across the country, yeah, and in those specials, they show me those same. I specifically doors. made the point earlier. No one doubts that there is a building, for example, that you can go to in Auschwitz and take the tour of, and they say, "Well, here's the gas chamber." They also will tell you something like, "When the Jews died, they all died." pressed up against the door. However, the door to the so-called chamber opens in. Now, the Germans are not stupid people, and if they were going to build a room where hundreds of people would die pressed up against the door, don't you think they would make the door to open out? Oh, and, uh, all right, let him finish, let him finish his question. So, I am sitting like Ben's in I must answer a question. He said there was, there was no Holocaust. There was no crematoriums and no gas chambers. Uh, he said there was no gas chambers. Uh, Eichmann's right hand, who the notorious Eichmann was the master builder of Auschwitz, of the crematorium and the gas chambers, his right hand, they had figured out that to kill a Jew cost three quarter of a cent. Then they came out with a cyclone gas that it cost only a half a cent. So they saved a penny, a half, quarter of a cent, by mass killing. And he felt so bad about it that he smuggled out some papers to the Swedish government and the Germans had very, book, very good book to see, Ernest, well, these are things, these are points when we go through this, and historically, wait a second, Dr. Dale, when we go through this historically, there's no way for us to know what he was thinking, whether he smuggled this or that. The only thing that we can know is whether or not there is fact. And let this gentleman answer, ask, finish his question. He's going to finish it very quickly. Right, right. What, so what were the uh, metal chambers that we saw with the metal gates coming out and the dead bodies inside well, now, all burned there were up? crematoria there, and they did cremate bodies. Uh, and we, fa we feel, for example, that the building in Auschwitz that you go to that is said to be the gas chamber was, in fact, the morgue. And you can actually see where walls have been knocked down, where they used to be separating the place into different rooms. One other real quick thing, if I may. Uh, a point about the Zyklon B gas that I'd like to make. Now, the nature of the Zyklon B is very important. Uh, the Germans said the Zyklon B was there to disinfect prisoners in their clothes to try and cut down on the typhoid epidemic, which we all admit was going on in the camps. If the gas was there not to do that but to kill Jews, how come there was just as much gas in the camps that were never said to function as execution camps as there are in camps like Auschwitz and camps that were supposedly meant to function okay, as execution Okay, now, Dr. Camps. Thaler, why don't you answer, answer Look, that? Look, it's absurd. This whole discussion is crazy. We can't come in with the mountains of documentation and eyewitness reports and, 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 and uh, case records that clearly establish the truth of, of what went on with the gas chambers and with the killing squads. I just want to state that my name is Michael Thaler and I am willing to mortgage my home and put up $50,000 to anyone who comes in with acceptable evidence, acceptable by scholarly historian standards, that there was no gas chambers, okay? End of discussion. I'm well, not okay, going to yeah, continue okay. this with these people. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a comment and a question. And make it very quick because we've got to go. Uh, first of all, I have the greatest sympathy for all innocent people who die in war, but the Jewish experience is not unique. I happen to be of Ukrainian descent, and seven million of my people were murdered, and this proportionate number of the perpetrators of these crimes in the Ukraine, the Ukrainian famine, happened to be Jews. Uh, Trotsky, Beria, <laughs> Dzerzhinsky, and uh, I'd like to know when I'm going to get my reparations for my murdered relatives. Okay. That's, that's also another issue. We'll, we'll take a break and we'll answer when we come back. We'll take a break. <laughs> You had a question, sir. Yes, I am a Holocaust survivor, and I'm the only one left from a family of seven. I would like to reply to the gentleman that says that Ukrainian, seven million Ukrainians were killed. The Ukrainians were the biggest collaborators with the Germans. They were even hired and worked in the concentration camps okay. to help exterminate the Jews. But, let's, so, uh, but do me a favor. Let's, let's, start, let's, let's not go back and forth from one, okay, one race. Not, let's answer the question about the Holocaust. Fine. You were there. I also, I also would like to tell you that the lady made a remark. My wife was 14 years old 
when she and her mother were taken to Auschwitz, and when her mother was ill and she couldn't work any longer, they took her to the crematorium and burned her. Now, these are facts that my wife is alive, and she is here, and she had told me those they stories. Burned her, they burned her alive? They burned her. They burned her. That's right. Because she could not work anymore. Because she could not work. She was too weak to work. See, before you go on, I'd say this, David, this is a point. And this is a Jewish gentleman. You are Jewish. Here's a man who, who has lived his whole life knowing, having these feelings, knowing what took place in his life. I have to ask you this because it's coming to me. Do, do you dislike yourself because you were Jewish no, and no, you were see, turned that, the other way? That's silly. Uh, two things real quick. First, for, as an atheist uh, and people all over the world every day claim to see God, I'm always willing to, to uh, believe that people can mislead themselves very easily. But secondly, I also would like to say that um, I want people to understand what my peculiar peculiar position is which is i hear eyewitnesses and then i hear other forensic and factual evidence what am i supposed to do would you like me then to just jump to the conclusion go along with the flow uh, what if everybody did that about every subject i have serious questions that i would like to be addressed no one has yet addressed my question about cyclone d gas no one has yet addressed well, my question you're, you're about also asking an audience report. that's that's just, not no, authorities you, on cyclone b gas go ahead, Anna. well they should be here i want to tell david one thing he should have been where I was. He would have seen what life is all about. How he won this. How he won. We used to get up every morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. They used to call, put us in, in a line. And they used to call us sailor pill. And they used to pick from each day from us to go to those gas chambers, day by day. We lived with that, we dreamt with that, and we slept with that. Well, I'd like to ask the revisionists, I've heard that you don't believe that there were gas chambers. Do you believe that genocide did indeed take place? And what exactly is your definition of genocide? If you mean by genocide, uh, the kind of treatment that was meted out to the American Indians or the blacks caught, then there was genocide. And there was a, for a, a policy, a kind of genocide against the Jews in Europe during the Second World War. I would say yes. But the Holocaust is defined rather differently. It's defined as the systematic extermination of six million Jews. I do not think that there is evidence for that. The word Holocaust itself is a more or less modern creation. It wasn't used during the war. It wasn't talked about at Nuremberg. It didn't come into popular usage until the 1960s or 70s. Go ahead, Dr. Thaler. I just want to uh, straighten out a few things, okay, from our own personal experience. Again, I'm not prepared to discuss this here with these gentlemen who are frauds. The point I'm making now is this. I, I want to make one point. First of all, there were seven million Jews just in the area of Poland and Russia alone. There were fewer than one million Jews in the rest of Europe. So when the Germans occupied Poland and part of Russia, they were stuck with all of these millions of Jews. The majority of those Jews never got to concentration camps. I heard a glib reference to ghettos. Well, I came from one of those ghettos. I came from a ghetto. And by the way, there were hundreds of ghettos, not just one or two. I came from one of those ghettos in the Ukraine. And we started out with 11,000 people in 1941. When the, when the Red Army came back in 1944, there were 306 left. Really? Nobody went to concentration camp. We were taken out and shot and I myself watched the last 2,500 Jews of my town machine guns okay, to death. We, we got to take a break, Dr. Phil. Okay, so you know you I saw it. We'll, we'll be back in just a second. <laughs> We've been talking about the Holocaust with the revisionists and survivors. Anna, you wanted to make one final point? Yeah, I would like to make one point. I came here for one reason, to tell the world that this Holocaust happened, and I'm a proof, I'm a living proof. I'm here to tell you that never again we should watch out for another Holocaust to whom it ever happened. It should never happen. No race, no human should let have to kill people. We gotta, we gotta go. Join us again on the next Montel Williams show.